Today, I want to share with you my favorite learning platform and today's sponsor, and that of course is brilliant.org. So as you might know, staying ahead in the world of technology is absolutely crucial, but sometimes it can be pretty hard to keep up with all the new trends and technologies. And that's where brilliant.org comes in. It's a fantastic platform that teaches maths and computer science interactively. And the best part is that it's personalized to your needs. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundational and advanced maths to AI, data science, neural networks, and more. They even add new lessons every month, so you're always up to date. And if you're like me and want to dive deeper into how technology works, then you have to check out Brilliant's recently released course on the subject. This packs with easy to understand explanations and interactive exercises that help you understand everything from the basics of how circuits work to how the internet works. What I love about Brilliant is how it focuses on outcomes for learners. It's not just about learning, it's what learning does for you or how it makes you feel. So if you want to give Brilliant a try, they're offering a free trial for 30 days and the first 200 of you to use, my link below will get 20% off your annual premium subscription. Go to brilliant.org forward slash brain food or click the link in the description. You won't regret it. Thank you, Brilliant, for the sponsorship. And now today's video. In the opening of the Oscar-winning 2007 film, No Country for Old Men, we're introduced to one of the most terrifying villains in cinema history, Anton Sugar, the ruthless Mexican hitman who believes life is controlled by random chance and kills at the toss of a coin. Though Sugar uses many weapons throughout the film, including a silenced shotgun and his own bare hands, perhaps the most unique takes the form of an air tank connected to a small handheld device, which Sugar presses to his victim's foreheads to insert instantly kill them. But while to the average filmgoer this weapon may appear to be little more than a disturbing cinematic invention, those who work in the livestock industry know that this is very much real. This device, known as a captive vault gun, is typically used not for murder, though we'll dive into that a little bit later in the video, but as part of another unpleasant process that few of us get to see, but which is ultimately essential for getting food onto our tables. Captive vault guns are one of a number of devices used in the practice of stunning, part of the process of slaughtering livestock for consumption. In most of the world, livestock slaughter is carried out via exsanguination, the opening of a vein to allow the animal to bleed out. Performed on its own, however, this procedure can cause an animal to panic and experience extreme distress until it finally loses consciousness from blood loss. Thus, in order to make slaughter more humane, most livestock are first stunned or rendered unconscious prior to exsanguination. For most of our history, stunning was carried out by striking the top of the animal's head with a large mallet or axe, but this technique required a great deal of strength and skill, so in the early 20th century, a number of easier, more reliable techniques were developed. Among these was the captive bolt gun, invented in 1903 by Hugo Heiss, the director of a slaughterhouse in Straubing in Germany. Captive bolt guns typically consist of a handheld cylindrical or gun-shaped device containing a heavy sliding metal rod or bolt propelled forward by either compressed air or a blank gunpowder cartridge. In use, the gun is placed directly against an animal's head and the trigger is pulled, driving the bolt at high speed into the skull. There are three main types of captive bolt guns, penetrating, non-penetrating, and free bolt. In penetrating bolt guns, the bolt penetrates the skull and destroys part of the animal's brain, producing immediate unconsciousness but leaving the brain stem intact, allowing the heart to keep pumping as the animal bleeds out. But while this is among the most effective and reliable stunning techniques, the destruction of brain tissue can cause the bloodstream to become contaminated with disease-causing agents such as the prion proteins that cause bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE, better known as mad cow disease. This was especially likely with older stunning devices, which injected compressed air into the animal's brain. For this reason, today, slaughterhouses are increasingly switching to non-penetrating captive vault guns, which have broad mushroom-shaped heads, which immediately retract after firing. These do not destroy the brain, but rather induce unconsciousness via blunt force trauma in a manner similar to the traditional mallet technique. Indeed, in the European Union, non-penetrating stunning techniques are mandated for the slaughter of animals intended for the manufacture of pharmaceuticals in order to avoid contamination. The third type of captive bolt gun, the free bolt variety, is typically used for the emergency field euthanasia of sick or injured livestock animals. Unlike in the previous two models, the bolt is not retained within the gun, but remains inside the animal's skull after after firing. The free bolt stunner was developed as an alternative to the standard farm euthanasia method of simply shooting the animal in the head with a rifle or a shotgun. While this technique is highly effective when correctly performed, it requires careful aim and can easily result in unwanted outcomes such as the bullet ricocheting off the animal's skull or hitting another part of its body, causing unnecessary pain and suffering. But while the free bolt stunner is more reliable in this respect, it requires the administering veterinarian to hold the gun directly against the animal's head, which can be difficult or even dangerous if the animal is agitated and can't be easily restrained. And while the massive brain trauma caused by a captive bolt stunner will inevitably result in the animal's death, the standard euthanasia procedure is to expedite the process either via 
exsanguination or the injection of lethal drugs such as potassium chloride, which quickly stops the animal's heart. Another common euthanasia technique is pithing, which involves inserting a wire or plastic rod through the hole left by the stunner and using it to scramble the brain stem, resulting in instant death. This technique was a once commonplace in slaughterhouses, but was widely banned in the early 21st century for use on animals destined for human consumption due to the risk of spreading BSE and other diseases. In most slaughterhouses, stunning is carried out in a center track restrainer, a narrow pen that holds the animal still and provides ready access to its head for placing the bolt gun against. Some facilities even include more elaborate head restraints to ensure accurate bolt gun placement. When properly administered, this technique results in between 96 to 98 percent of livestock being rendered completely unconscious and insensitive to pain with a single shot. Based on recommendations from Temple Grandin, the famous animal behavior expert and animal welfare activist, American slaughterhouses must demonstrate at least a 95 percent first shot stunning rate to pass inspection, with a 5 percent second shot buffer being granted to deal with those rare animals which are not rendered completely unconscious with a single shot. While captive bolt guns are the most common form of livestock stunning in most of the world, some slaughterhouses, especially those specializing in smaller animals like pigs, sheep, and goats, instead use electric shocks, a process known as electronarcosis. Developed in France and Germany in the later 1920s, electronarcosis administers an electric shock to the animal's head using a set of fork or scissor-shaped electrodes. This disrupts the animal's regular brain activity and effectively induces a tonic-clonic or grand mal epileptic seizure. Unlike captive bolt stunning, however, electronarcosis is temporary and reversible, with the animal typically regaining consciousness within a few minutes. It's thus vital for the animal to be slaughtered immediately so that it does not wake up before it expires. For this reason, slaughterhouses which use electronarcosis will also typically slaughter animals not through exsanguination, but rather electrocution, using another set of electrodes which passes a high amperage current through the animal's heart, resulting in immediate cardiac arrest. As an interesting aside, in 1938, the practice of stunning pigs using electricity inspired Italian psychiatrist Hugo Saletti to develop electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, for the treatment of mental illness. In any event, while stunning animals prior to slaughter is legally mandated in most of the world, there is one major exception. Animals slaughtered according to religious regulations such as Jewish kashrut or Islamic halal rules. In Jewish tradition, for example, an animal can only be considered kosher or fit for human consumption if it a does not fall into any of the forbidden or unclean categories such as pigs, shellfish, or fish without fins or scales, and b it is not already dead or suffering from deformities or injuries, and c it has been slaughtered according to the ritual procedure known as the shechita. This process, performed by an individual known as a sochat, involves cutting through the animal's trachea and esophagus using a special long knife called a sachin or chalaf. The cut must be made in one smooth motion without hesitation, excessive pressure, excessive penetration, cutting in the wrong location, or tearing the trachea or windpipe. Performing any of these forbidden techniques results in the animal being declared terrafar, or the equivalent to carrion. The equivalent Islamic procedure, known as the Dahabiba, is almost identical with the added requirement that the butcher declare that the slaughter of each animal is performed in the name of God via a blessing. Traditionally, these procedures are performed without any prior stunning. Indeed, by severing not only the trachea and esophagus, but also both jugular veins and carotid arteries, when these are properly performed, they result in rapid unconsciousness and exsanguination and inflict minimal pain and suffering upon the animal. However, in 1958, the United States government passed the Humane Slaughter Act, mandating that all animals must be rendered unconscious and insensitive to pain prior to slaughter. The act does not exempt animals slaughtered according to religious regulations on the grounds that while the unconsciousness produced by procedures like the sahita and dahiba is rapid, it is not instantaneous like that produced by a captive bolt or electrical stunning. Many other nations have since adopted similar laws. Thankfully, many religious organizations like the Egyptian Fatwa Commission have embraced such requirements, arguing that the Torah and Quran only require an animal's heart to be beating during the slaughter and that stunning fulfills the commandment for compassion and humaneness towards animals. Other groups, however, like the Halal Food Standard Alliance of America, take the opposite stance, arguing that, quote, the common factor in all these methods of stunning is causing extra pain to the animal above and beyond the pain experienced during the slaughter itself. For this reason, many scholars have declared that the act of stunning is extremely disliked and close to being impermissible. Stunning is a very serious matter, and some scholars have used extremely strong language when describing the practice of stunning, such as against the spirit of Islam and an evil innovation. Therefore, a Muslim should avoid using this practice as much as possible possible when slaughtering an animal. Other groups further argue that, in order to meet kashrut or halal requirements, animals must be conscious during the slaughtering process, making stunning impermissible. Therefore, the question of whether stunning is incompatible with Jewish or Islamic law remains a highly contentious one.
But by now you're probably wondering, have captive bolt guns ever actually been used for murder, like in No Country for Old Men? And surprisingly, the answer is yes, though these cases are extremely rare, with one of the first being reported in Germany in 1991. The perpetrator, a 46-year-old railway worker known in literature only as MG, had a history of alcoholism resulting in recurring epileptic seizures and was extremely aggressive and abusive towards his family, not allowing his wife to leave the house alone to take a job. In 1990, he was diagnosed with a throat tumor and underwent a laryngectomy, losing his ability to speak. On October 5, 1991, MG's wife failed to show up at work. When questioned by police, he claimed that she had left that morning for Munich. However, police soon discovered the wife's money and identity documents in the house, along with several hastily cleaned up blood trails. While MG claimed that he had struck his wife during an argument, causing a severe nosebleed, the following day, her body was discovered in the basement with two head wounds from a cartridge fired captive bolt pistol. Under interrogation, MG admitted to murdering his wife out of jealousy, preferring to kill her than lose her to another man. However, he never faced justice for his crimes, dying of cancer one month later while awaiting trial. More recently, a captive bolt pistol was involved in the murder of a 38-year-old fitness instructor, Mary Griffiths, of Bury St. Edmunds in England. Her murderer, a 40-year-old slaughterhouse worker named John McFarlane, had been romantically rejected by Griffiths, who posted on Facebook that he was delusional if he thought they'd ever have a relationship. On the night of May 6, 2009, McFarlane, who had no prior history of violence, broke into Griffiths' house with an axe, dragged her out of her bedroom, and fatally shot her three times in the chest with a captive bolt pistol. In November of that year, McFarlane was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. While several other homicides involving captive bolt pistols have been reported, the specialized nature of these devices and the need to get close to the victims means that their use as murder weapons is still exceptionally rare. Thus, whenever they are used to such nefarious ends, the authorities are, understandably, rather stunned.